So this is some work uh, that we have kind of worked on for a few years, and it's one particular strain of this work that I will present today, and which I've done with together with Charlotte at Norwegian Computing Center. But there's really a big team on NR that has been working within this field uh, for, for many years now. So it's a big activity on the research side. <clears throat> so just to take a bit of, of my kind of background and, and a bit of my view on the data science. So I really like this Rue Conaway drawing uh, or, or Venn diagram where you can see the different kind of parts of what's happening in what is needed for a proper data science project. So of course I, I like it because uh, I'm not in the danger zone because I'm math and statistics, but really each of these corners, this just two overlaps have their own problems. So if you don't have the substantive expertise, then really whatever you find out, it is deemed to be irrelevant because you haven't put it in the right context. Then on the other side, if you don't, uh, if you don't know, if you don't have the proper methodology, you really can't trust the answer you come up with. And then we are in the kind of problems I most often have is that uh, we are in the traditional research where we don't uh, have the ability to actually compute the answer. We know what we wonder about, we know how we would like to compute it, but we were not able to do the computations. So, <clears throat> For inverse problem, which I will talk about today, there are some issues. Actually, there's some, some real trust issues when we're and they're trying to come from this danger zone into this data science zone. What I'm going to talk about is actually coming from this traditional search uh, research and getting myself into this data science zone. Example of, of explainability. Well, what we do today. Uh, this is a bit uh, cartoonish, but OK. In deep learning, we utilize high performance computing to make very complex models. And then we use explainability, or at least one strain of explainability, to interpret the model. Whereas, in, in my view, we should uh, explain the data. But our focus is on the other side. We want to use this to do uh, the high performance computing to do the complex computations. So if we do the computations that we think is required, then we do not have to think about uh, explainability because that is given in the way we formulate the problem. So it's a bit about the different angles that we are, are, are kind of approaching and all trying to get into the same corner of, of the data science projects. So a bit about linear inverse problems. Some of you might not have heard about them. Uh, typically many parameters that we want to solve. I have an equation uh, up, up in the corner. Let me see if I can uh, have a laser here. Um, so M is the parameters we want. G is now something that uh, that is a design matrix in statistic term. It's a forward map in, in the inverse literature. Uh, and But it, this is what relates uh, uh, our observation, which is D, to, to our parameters. So typical problem for uh, inverse problems are ill post, and most often it's non-uniqueness. So the simple example is that you have one equation and you have two unknowns. A more kind of complex example, but with the same issues, is uh, deconvolution, where you have a, a parameter you want to uh, reconstruct, but you only have a convolved version of that image uh, at your uh, at hand, and you want to reconstruct this one. So the thing is that there's missing information. So there's two things we have to do then. First of all, we have to provide a reasonable solution, and then we need to assess the uncertainty in this uh, answer. Typical is arises where we have indirect measurements. I'll have some examples for that later. But the particular setting I'm working on now is 
with one additional term into this equation, which is the lateral one here. So <clears throat> the linear part, which is this one, is the linear uh, problem, which we kind of is very well studied and very well formalized. But very often, uh, the parameters that, that the data are related to are not the parameters that we are really interested in. So typically, we will be interested in what I have called R and F down here, which is kind of latent target properties. Uh, and these are then linked to the uh, in some intermediate parameter through a local link. So this is point by point. You can kind of relate this through a uh, function. But of course, there's some nuisance parameters, parameters that you are really not interested in, really don't, not, don't know so much about, that also influence the intermediate parameter. And it's this intermediate parameter that gives us the observed data. So we have one additional link going backward. So this is uh, the example we, I have been working most with is seismic inversion. We have a uh, wave propagation. When we collect the waves, we get the gathers. These are the data. But then we need to uh, kind of, what we really are interested in is how the layering, how the structure is of the subsurface. We want to find the, the structure to discuss the history of the Earth and to identify high hydrocarbons in this rock. But the same setting we have for CT images, uh, where we have uh, absorption is, is kind of the feature we are looking for, but we are interested in, in density and, and tissue. And in my setting, I'm interested in this because I want to see the inner structure of a rock. So actually this image is comes from this type of machine where we have put a rock rod in the middle here, whereas this image is from a much higher resolution CT scan. So in this framework, we have the Bayesian formalisms that gives us a very good way of solving this. So we have the property of interest and we have the link to the intermediate property and we have the data likelihood. So that kind of gives us this way up. And if we want to have the probability of this target variable, then given the data, we just have to perform this integral, which is a very high dimensional. And approaching this through important sampling, that is just not feasible. Uh, you will have one sample that is, will always be the best one, and it won't be particularly good uh, at all. MCMC -MC approaches is really prohibitive because we have millions of uh, parameters and it takes us two hours to solve a 200 by one problem. So it's really, yeah, it's a really hard uh, problem we are trying to solve here. An additional feature that is more a practical aspect and not uh, kind of strictly theoretical is that the prior that we're using is not really known. It's, we can come up with many statistical models like the POTS model, other things. But really, if we want to do this full MCMC part and we don't trust actually the prior, then what's the value of everything we are doing here? So it's kind of the large scale features of the, of the prior model are a bit loosey in what we're doing. So it, it's, a, it's a hard problem, not only because it's hard to solve the integral, but also because there's some parts that we are not so certain about how we'll behave. So what we are doing in this approach is that we're trying what we call a sample free inference. So we want to do this without doing the Markov chain uh, Monte Carlo part. But as I said, the problem is too big. So what we do is that we focus down on one particular sliding window. And then, of course, the integral over M is as big, but this uh, relation here uh, is then uh, less influenced by all the data that we have. And when we are able to compute the likelihood for this window for our target par parameters, then uh, we can compute the posterior distribution. So the computations are then identical for a sliding window. Uh, that's why I call it a convolutional computation. So this type of local approximation is not new. In seismic inversion, 
this has been uh, done uh, in, for uh, for many years, and um, and many people has contributed. Among others, uh, people that are currently at the Norwegian Computing Center, Julum uh, uh, and, and Felsta, uh, which then utilize this. First, they can kind of do this local approximation. Next, we can actually piece this local approximation together to make a full joint distribution. And then, uh, uh, but but then how to kind of truncate, how to make the data local, that kind of theory is lacking. And that is what we are going to see today. And we are going to use uh, the approach of expectation propagation in this. So the local approach approximation it is not new, but the date, the way we truncate the data, that is what we are going to have a look at. So just to say a bit about expectation propagation, uh, it's a case of variational inference in, in the general case. So in variational inference, we replace a hard integral with an easy integral and an optimization where we try to find a distribution that is very close to the distribution that we want, but uh, that is easy to integrate. And uh, in the order to do this, we need two choices. We need a discrepancy measure and we need a class of distributions that we optimize over. So then the common choice is the kullback leibler divergence, which is not symmetric. So this is a very large, important, great importance when we are doing this type of inference because we don't want to undersell the uncertainty in our problem. So if we uh, try to know an example where we have this variational inference, then we have the approximate distribution in the front, expectation propagation, then we have it in the back. So let's just have a, an example here where we have a target which is correlated Gaussian and approximation we say that this should be independent caution. So in the first case, if you go for this first one, it actually chooses to approximate the mean and conditional variance. And it really is important for this approximation to not to wander into this region, not to avoid, it wants to avoid low probability for all costs. And you can see that because if it's a low probability, then you divide by, uh, zero and this becomes a very large number. The other part is actually the opposite. It wants to, to include high probabilities. It wants to include all high probabilities. And that is a way to kind of cover the uh, uh, uncertainty in a much better way. And that is why this is the approach we have, have used. So when we do this local inference, we want to do this uh, integration uh, in parts. So first we have this integral that we need to compute, but then we split this up, this part here, into two parts. So we split it into a buffer zone, and then we have this window zone. And we need to select this buffer zone such that we can remove this uh, uh, target variable from uh, the conditioning bar here. So basically, uh, we want this buffer zone to be so large that it doesn't create, uh, so, so that it, this R creates a shadow. So if you just, uh, if you look R on the outside and look back in, the only thing you can see is the MR. And, and this R, the only thing we know for certain is that it should be larger than the window we are trying to look at. So we have three regions. We have the outer region, the buffer region, and, and the target region. So we integrate out first the outer region and then the buffer region. So in, to integrate the outer region, we are now back in the sit old school situation where we have only this parameter, uh, M, that we are interested in. And then uh, uh, we have a framework for uncertainty where we can have, if this is a multi-normal distribution, then we can actually compute and the, uh, we have the prior distribution defined and we can comp compute the posterior distribution based on the different quantities that are 
and we can include both the mean and the variance. So we have control of the location and the uncertainty of this estimate. Examples of this is for the deconvolution. We can do this really fast in Fourier domain. It's just dividing uh, and taking account of the variability of, of, of M in the equation. So we can have this, this type of computation to, to get the mean and, and the covariance in, in the stationary case can be really fast. It's just a, a deconvolution, an old school deconvolution, I would say. But the thing is, in addition to having the parameters, we also include the uncertainty. And that's an important part, which we'll see later. Because now we want to integrate the outer region. And what we have done is then to see, well, uh, these are the, um, this is the prior distribution, which we then approximate. And uh, uh, to say, well, uh, these are the large scale features that are important in the inversion. And then we can update and compute the posterior distribution. And then what we now use is that we have the prior and we have the posterior of MR. So this equation up here, these are for the full uh, inversion, whereas these are now, we are just considering what's in the inner part here. So the M up here uh, contains this MR, which is inside the window. And now we can then actually do the reverse of what many patients do. We can compute the likelihood, which is then uh, proportional to the uh, posterior divided by the prior. So now uh, what we want to do is actually to see what kind of observations is it that will give us this likelihood. So we have the expression for the likelihood. We want to kind of uh, instead of using this just an expression, we want to put this in as a, an equivalent set of observations. And in order to do that, actually what we do is uh, the generalized eigenvalues. So we compute generalized eigenvalues and vectors of the posterior covariance matrix with respect to the prior. So then we get a set of, of features which have uh, a certain kind of properties. They are uh, uh, first of all, they are independent. The features are independent, both in the prior and the posterior. They're not orthogonal since we are doing the generalized eigenvalues, but they are in the statistical sense independent in both the prior and the posterior. The eigenvalues show how much shrinkage each feature have from the prior to the posterior. So if the lambda is zero, it means that uh, actually this feature is determined full in full by the data. That doesn't happen too often. If, if it's one, this means that these data have no information about this feature at all. And if it's somewhere in between, we can compute a set of equivalent observations um, <clears throat> by taking out the prior distribution and the posterior distribution, and we can compute which are the equivalent observations and how large are the errors that we have. So then we can just gather these features. We have now these features as um, observations of the MR, and we have then this uh, additional error term, which we know the covariance. So now we have zoomed in to this small region, leaving all other data outside. And then within this region, we uh, make the approximation of uh, using that of MR given the target variable to be uh, normally distributed uh, with a mean uh, and a covariance, which depend on this R. So of course the challenge is to have good expressions here, but these are something that we can uh, uh, use many different methodologies to, to do. Among those, we could do uh, use neural networks uh, kind of to estimate these uh, parameters. And now we want to integrate out this MR, and we can do that really easily because everything is now from this equation linear. So we really, we get the likelihood here now with our kind of condensed data to be just a normal uh, distribution. So if we set up the problem, 
we have a prior in the outer region, which we assume to be uh, uh, only conditional on the second order relations. In the buffer region, we need to have some conditional stationarity of the properties. But uh, the final step is actually the prior distribution of the parameters, uh, target parameter itself. And this one does not need to be stationary. So uh, up here, things are uh, stationary, conditioned on this parameter. Uh, but if we do not, uh, but the parameter itself might be non stationary. So in the target zone, uh, we can use now low dimensional integration methods to compute the, we have the likelihood and we can evaluate this uh, um, posterior distribution. So what we have used it for is discrete cases, and then we can actually just compute the updated posterior. So this is the example from the uh, uh, discrete case. You now there are four different options here, and meaning that there are really many uh, kind of cases, potential cases that we have. And if we did this in the MCMC, that is quite more than 10 years ago, so uh, it might be faster now, but basically it takes two hours to just solve this for, for one trace. So it's not something we can do uh, on, a, on a large scale. Something we can do to check the results we get though. So if we compare now, uh, basically there are two kind of things, ways we reduce it. We can reduce the size of the outer region, this R, and we can see how many parameters uh, in of the eigenvalues should we keep. And we can say this is without the focusing, and so we have a maximum of 8.94 here. But really we can, if we do the focusing, uh, in our inversion, we can get a better approximation with a region which is then uh, one tenth of the size. So we can really get a good speed up in in what we are doing. Uh, and so applications we have used this where there are twelve different phases uh, or discrete choices we could have. And one of the things we did was to map out the boundary of, of a zone here which was a certain set of uh, these facies, which should be contained within a, a boundary up here. So the prior was actually quite wide. It is, uh, it's perhaps a bit hard to see, but it's on staple purple lines here. And this is actually the posterior that we obtained. And we can see that the prior was, we initially didn't know whether we should be down here or up here, but uh, the method correctly chose uh, what was uh, the upper, upper one. So it's, uh, very convenient. We can reuse the computations. We, we have the ability to include the non-stationary, so we can control the assumptions that we are making locally here. So that's a really uh, big advantage. So even though uh, the, this fasc fascist that we have within this boundary, we say that, well, it won't be present above here and, and below here, and that is also one way of reducing the number of, of possibilities. We do not uh, need MCMC and we do not need the sampling, and we can also then, we can gather them, as I said, to build a full uh, structure laterally, but also we can do this uh, correlated spatially. The medical resolution was uh, medical CT versus the high resolution images. We were trying to predict the rock void uh, in, in these uh, rocks. And we could see that it was uh, the outer region was, uh, the method was quite stable with uh, respect to the outer region that we had. So uh, this focusing uh, on a small part can actually help us big up the, build up the big picture again. And, and when we use this uh, uh, approximate distributions, it gives us uh, alternatives uh, to the Marco chain Monte Carlo uh, method. So we are shown that this is uh, really useful and, and how to use this uh, generalized eigenvalues to actually progress beyond the initial uh, uncertainty. And uh, it's uh, currently commercial in a large uh, scale uh, seismic inversion software, and there's really much uh, flexibility in the approach. 
um, it's a robust uh, and we the main thing is that the computer computations can be reused and they are parallelizable. So some references here and thank you.